in August 7 of 2017 at 5 p.m. I just left my office when I was going to prepare a meeting with the citizens of El Atillo, where I was mayor in Caracas. At that time, I had a phone call from my lawyer saying that the regime Supreme Court had just announced at its Facebook page that it had an illegal and arbitrary trial uh, in 40 hours. In only 40 hours, I had to say goodbye to my family. I had to uh, prepare a meeting with my cabinet. I had to meet with more than 400 public servants that worked for me for more than three years. And more importantly, I had to meet with thousands of citizens to tell them that it is important to defend democracy in the institutions because I was elected democratically. They went against us because I was part of the leadership that called for nonviolent protests for four months. Those, those, four, those nonviolent protests uh, had a clear goals. We were asking for humanitarian aid, we were asking for free and fair elections, and we were asking for the release of hundreds of political prisoners. The regime also went against us because our local government was able to decrease kidnapping more than 80%, and we tackled corruption to the point that we were one of the top three transparent local governments in Venezuela according to international transparency. So August 9th came, it was the trial, the 40 hours passed, and at 9 p.m., uh, I was sentenced to jail, in a, where that jail has a torture center. I was ruled out for any public administration role, and of course, I was removed uh, as a mayor of El Atillo in Caracas. I knew that that was going to be the result, because a few days before, five mayors uh, happened the same. The, the uh, illegal trial went on first against them. So I decided to go to clandestinity. The day after of, of, uh, the, day after of, 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 of that, of the trial, people went to rally to support me and reject what happened on, on that decision. 18 patrols of the regime, the secret police, with almost 40 men with large arms, went against that people asking for me. They also kidnapped my uh, director of citizen security and extracted all the information from his phone, and he was seriously psychologically tortured, asking for me. They didn't know where I was. I was in hiding. I spent 35 days in hiding. I read, I wrote, I pray. I, I had opportunity to have a small TV sometimes while I watch the news and I watch sports and also did some exercise to keep my body fit, but especially my, uh, my brain uh, uh, healthy and, and focused. My plan A was to flee the country through a boat, but it was not possible because the regime prohibited any sailing. So I had to take the most risky decision to flee the country through the longest route through Brazil. I went 1,100 kilometers I passed 35 checkpoints. I was stopped in eight of those checkpoints, and in four of those, I was asked to be out of the car. They did not recognize me because I had to shave my beard, wore glasses, wore a flat hat, and I was dressed as a seminarist, like the ones that work with the priest. I was able to get to Brazil, what we call in Spanish, trocha, an illegal path, and the federal police of Brazil gave me protection in that moment. I took a, a plane to Brasilia, where I met the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil, Aloysio Nunes, and in that moment I met public that I was in exile. And the regime, of course, went crazy because they didn't caught me. Officially, in that moment, I became the third generation of a family that has to flee a, a country because of a communist regime. My parents fled the Soviet Union in the 1920s. My grandparents had to flee again, in this case, Cuba, 
1970 with my father, who was a teenager. And in 2017, it was my turn. But having said all of that, this is not about me. This is beyond my story. This is about Venezuela. This is about four million people that have fled a country because of 10 million percent of hyperinflation. This is a story about millions that have been victims of um, a lack of food and medicine, which according to the UN, one third of the population needs humanitarian assistance, which is the same as 10 million people. This is about human rights violations, where just the last years, according to the UN as well, more than 5,000 extra judicial killings have happened in Venezuela. This is about our economy that used to be one of the best in the region and now is having 10 million percent of hyperinflation. This is about people that wake up every day with no water, with no electricity. So Venezuela used to be one of the most stable democracies in the world for four decades. One of the most booming economies of Latin America and the Caribbean. And I am part of a generation that didn't know what was that. I am a part of a generation that has grown up in a dictatorship. And we have been witnessed on how democracy could be used to destroy democracy. In two, day, in two weeks, it will be two years of that August 7th. Since then, I've been living in exile, working from Washington through Latin America and the Caribbean to restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela, but at the same time, designing policies to protect migrants and refugees because those four million are the second largest in the world, just below Syria. I don't have children yet. My dream is to have them, but to have them in Venezuela. And I want them to grow in a nation with security and non-violence. I want them to grow in a nation with uh, opportunities and no starvation. I want them to grow in a nation with democracy, with freedom, and no dictatorship. Thank you so much.